Hi everyone, Scott from Tilly the Lad here. Today I wanted to talk about the importance of Sonic Mania. This is not going to be a review. As you'll soon see, I am far too biased to host an objective and critical discussion of the game. Instead, I'm going to try and explain what makes it so special to fans like myself. Let's start our discussion with this question. Why is this game called Sonic Mania? This was a title reportedly suggested by Takashi Izuka, the boss at Sonic Team, the developers of the mainline installments, most recently Forces and Frontiers, and series lead. It was meant to convey the notion that this was a project helmed by the mania, that is to say, hardcore, passionate fans. These are the kinds of people who spend their free time making fan-made games and ROM hacks for little, indeed more often no money. Most companies in the video game industry choose to keep this hardcore section of their audience at arm's length. That is their prerogative and they are absolutely entitled to do that. Additionally, they have valid reasons for wanting to keep their distance, as these fans can often prove themselves to be immature and unreliable partners. But with that said, Sega set an example of another approach, to engage with them. In the early 2010s, when the company gave an individual named Christian Whitehead, who would later go on to serve as lead director for Sonic Mania, the opportunity to make an official port of Sonic CD for mobile devices and PC. This port used Whitehead's proprietary engine known as the Retro Engine. Sega was clearly satisfied with this output and commissioned Whitehead and his team to bring Sonics 1 and 2 to mobile in 2013. These are considered the definitive versions of the Blue Blur's first two Genesis adventures, and they form the foundation of 2022's Sonic Origins. Both entries are playable in full, native 16x9 widescreen. The Sonic 2 Halfpipe special stages now take place in full 3D environments instead of the simulated ones in the original release. The Spin Dash, one of the most iconic moves from the 16-bit games that is noticeably absent in the original title, is retroactively added to it. My personal favorite addition is Hidden Palace Zone in Sonic 2. This was one of those long lost levels that was nearly completed but never ended up making it into the game's original release in 1992. The 2013 mobile version adds it back in where it can be accessed via a secret passage in Mystic Cave Zone. Around 2016, the team responsible for the acclaimed mobile ports approached Sega with the idea of a brand new 2D entry in the series. It would act as a continuation of the Genesis slash Mega Drive titles, whose story ended in 1994 with the release of Sonic and Knuckles. Sega greenlit the project, and development began. This was a remarkable turn of events. Mania, at its core, is essentially an officially sanctioned and supported fan-made game. There are very few other companies who would do this. Sega is not perfect, far from it, but I do think they deserve a lot of credit for not only allowing this to happen, but for fully supporting this with their own resources. I hope more of their peers follow suit. Sonic Mania is very much intentionally styled as a Sega Saturn title we never got. Its art style and graphics were intended to look in between the 16-bit and 32-bit consoles, and the special stages feature low-poly 3D models reminiscent of the era. The Saturn was Sega's 32-bit console that competed against the original PlayStation and the Nintendo 64. The system finished in a distant third place, with a little over 9 million units sold across its four-year life cycle from 1994 to 1998. There are of course many reasons why it never made it mainstream outside of Japan. A full discussion of this warrants a whole other video, for the curious I'd recommend Sega Lord X's video on the subject. One such reason is because the console never received its own original mainline Sonic title. The original developers for the franchise, the likes of Yuji Naka, moved on to other IPs during the Saturn era. They made games like Nights into Dreams and Burning Rangers. Sega of course planned on having such a product made for the Saturn, and with the main development team focusing on other projects, the company instead gave the assignment to the California-based and now defunct Sega Technical Institute, or STI. The studio did have previous experience with the series, so this decision did make some sense. Along with guidance and leadership from Japanese veterans like Mr. Naka, the studio made Sonic 2 for the Genesis slash Mega Drive. This is widely considered one of the Hedgehog's best outings. STI began work on a project called Sonic Extreme, 
but sadly, for a plethora of reasons, the game never got off the ground and languished in development hell before it was eventually canned. Sega disbanded STI shortly thereafter. Sonic Jam, a compilation of the four main Genesis slash Mega Drive installments, hit store shelves in the summer of 1997. It was excellent and set the bar for future such collections. It had a variety of quality of life improvements, but its best addition, at least in my humble view, was Sonic World, a fully realized 3D environment where the player could complete some basic objectives and visit museums that contained artwork and commercials from the franchise's history. Later that year, the British developer Traveler's Tales, along with assistance from the series' main development team in Japan, released Sonic R. This was a mascot racer, sort of in the vein of titles like Mario Kart 64 and Crash Team Racing. It was met with more mixed reception because it severely lacked content, there were only five tracks for players to race on, and used tank controls. Regardless of their quality, these two entries could never carry the franchise on the Saturn. They were meant to act as a supplement to a mainline game, but of course that never came. Mania rectified that mistake. It did so far, far too late. The Saturn has long since passed and the damage of that console generation was one of a number of factors that forced Sega to leave the console manufacturing business altogether. But still, we finally got to see what that game could have looked like. On a more personal note, Sonic Mania helped get me back into the series. I've touched on this on the channel before, but the original Genesis title is one of the first video games I ever played and is a huge part of the reason why I have this hobby and why I adore that 16-bit console. I also had a Dreamcast growing up and I remember being enamored with Adventure 2. But as I grew older, I began losing touch with the series. I think part of the reason is because I wanted to play more mature titles. This is when I got into the likes of Halo, Gears of War, and Grand Theft Auto, among many others. I think another reason is because the Sonic franchise shifted its focus to a newer, mostly younger audience. This is not a bad thing, and it probably was the right decision, given that the series has always appealed to this demographic. Regardless of the reason or reasons, none of the installments that released in the mid-2000s to mid-2010s interested me. From my perspective, they tried to incorporate new flavor of the day mechanics, focused on existing characters that didn't gel with me or introduced new ones that never intrigued me, and included narratives that took themselves way, way too seriously. In hindsight, I can see now that not all of this was fair of me to think, but it was how I saw things. Sonic Mania represented a dramatic shift from this. It was Sega making a direct outreach to people like me. I think the message they were trying to relay was, we haven't forgotten about you. They made an entry tailored for us older folks, the ones who remember and grew up playing these games on Sega hardware. It brought me right back to the Genesis slash Mega Drive days and reminded me why I became a fan of the series in the first place. That's a huge part of the reason why I think Mania is so special. Sonic 1 and Adventure 2 are among my favorite games. They aren't great from a critical perspective. The original 16-bit entry, while certainly not bad by any means, is nevertheless outclassed in almost every way by its sequels and successors. Adventure 2 has clear, crystal clear signs of growing pains. I adore them so much, at least in part, because I grew up with them and viewed them through the lens of childhood wonder. I think it's telling, then, that Mania, a title that released when I was about 21 years old, nearly a full-on adult, sparks that same sort of feeling and wonder in me. I really hope we get a sequel to it one day, but even if we don't, I'll remain content knowing that we at least got this one. Thank you everyone for watching, and until next time, take care.